This week's podcast is sponsored by MPB, the simplest and safest way to sell photo and video kit. Free up funds from your kit bag and get paid fast. Find out how much MPB will pay you at mpb.com forward slash sell. Hello and welcome to the Performance Podcast for Monday the 23rd of May. The Movies Podcast, as always, will be following us a little bit later on. This is the Hardware Podcast. And joining me tonight, as always, is Ed Selly. Hi, Ed. Evening, Phil. You all right? Yep, very good, thank you. Uh, doing the news tonight, as always, is Ian Collin. Hi, Ian. Good evening. And talking calibration and all things professional image quality is Julian Scott. Hi, Jules. Good evening. Uh, right, like I say, Movies Podcast coming up at half past eight tonight if you're watching live. Welcome to you if you are watching live. It's great to see you once again. Uh, if you're listening a little bit later on, uh, if it's the audio-only version, then both of these podcasts will be edited together in one long podcast. Uh, so Movies follows the hardware. Um, and, of course, the chat window is open tonight as well. So if you are watching live, you want to ask us any questions, uh, then hit us up in the chat window next to the video as it's running live and we will answer those if you're listening a little bit later on in the week and you want to ask questions then it's podcast at avforums.com on the email and we'll come to it the next available podcast uh, we'll answer those questions uh, right so lots to get through tonight there's been a, a big hi-fi show happening mm. um, we've had some product launches that i've been along to and uh, Jules has been calibrating as always, and Ian's been writing the news. So we've got all of that coming up tonight. Um, so very briefly, we're going to go through competitions. Uh, we're then going to go through AV news, uh, hi-fi news. We're covering the Munich show. Uh, they then got a Panasonic OLED launch event. I'll quickly go over that. There is a full video on YouTube uh, that goes into it in quite some detail. We'll skim over the top and tell you uh, the main things to, that you need to know about. Uh, and then also we have Ed's album playlist of the week and we're talking white balance tonight what is white balance and why is it important jules is going to tell you everything and ably to say you demonstrated i was going to say disabled there it's not <laughs> demonstrated by these two tvs behind me um hopefully the webcam can pick that up as mm. well so that's everything we're covering tonight but what have we been up to since the last podcast you guys always want to know this so jules what you been up to? Um, changing bedpans. Um, oh yeah. My wife <laughs> broke her ankle and can't, you know couldn't get out of bed, so I've been learning right. the, the art of changing a bedpan, which is um, fun. Um, aside from that, I've been getting addicted to the uh, Court TV with the Depp Heard going on at the moment. Oh, oh never. no! Oh, oh no. yeah, never. getting withdrawal oh. symptoms. It's getting really hot. <sighs> Yeah, you've just gone down on my expectations. Well, you know, it's just it, well, it is, it is, it's <laughs> gripping, but you wouldn't want it in the UK, I have to say. No, no, we don't want any like that. Assessment. No, no, absolutely. No, not. And besides, that means that you don't get the brilliant court art. I mean, did you see some of the drawings of, um, of uh, Wayne Rooney in the? Um, <laughs> yes. In that, yeah. I mean, uh, one of them, he looked like he would he'd been dug up near Stonehenge. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I think that's a much more charming way of showing these events. If I'm honest, Very quaint. Yes. Excellent. Uh, Ian, what have you been doing? Uh, hang on, let me guess. Playing video games. Yes. Yeah, I'm watching football. So I'm, I'm nothing if not predictable. But this this time I have been doing them both at the same time, so I'm multitasking. So it's, mm. it's kind of progress. But yeah, it was um, obviously the end of season football, still crazy couple of days. Um, then that's also been tied in with uh, the Minecraft project that I've been playing and working on, kind of wrapping up. Um, and actually got a little bit a little bit depressing because this weekend, whilst I was kind of watching the football, I was kind of adding all the, the titles and the headers and stuff to the Minecraft thing. And it made me realise that I'm writing it for obviously a, a teenager, young sort of child audience. And all my kind of go-to headers and gags and puns are all outdated. Yeah. <laughs> like everything. It was like, oh, I can't have that. They won't understand it. Like I was doing a piece on just basically trading in Minecraft, how you can... Uh, trade goods and I was coming out what should I call it I came up with like swap shop and it was like no kids will never get it <laughs> and then it's like okay what else should I call it happy shopper I, I are those shops even, even still around I don't know the kids aren't going to get it so I had to kind of go through about five or six different things and it was like I think I ended up with happy deals and I thought yeah you know McDonald's is a safe bet everyone knows what it <laughs> so yeah that was about the peak of my weekend it was just exciting football and tedious headlines 
Yeah, I, I, I sympathise. Like, periodically, I have to write um, pieces aimed at a Generation Z, as they are in America, and yeah. uh, even even younger than that audiences. And <laughs> bless her, the uh, sub I work with at the American publication goes, um, yeah, so some of these references aren't going to work. <laughs> they just really aren't. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, yeah. Well, I've, I've been gigging again. Not, not me gigging. I've been going to gigs. Uh, so um, last week I saw Sarah Millican uh, oh, in Newcastle. Yeah. Yep. Um, very, very good. Very, very funny. Uh -huh. um, rude. It was yeah, it's very blue uh, at the Tyne Theatre. Um, never been in that venue before. Very old-fashioned opera house type theatre building. Um, very impressive. Um, we were in the gods, right up the top in the gods. But it was it was good fun, good laugh. And then on the Saturday night in Newcastle again. I went to see the Divine Comedy live. Um, yeah, they are. Well, I haven't. I, when I say that I, they're good live, I the, I saw them in nineteen ninety nine. So I mean, it was a while ago. But they well, were they're, they're still good live. They're still very good live. Um, and and of course, the full full band there did all the the greatest hits as well as uh, some of the new stuff that they've been they've been putting out as well. Uh, nice mixed audience um, in terms of age groups and so on. They, they obviously they've been around thirty odd years, so. Uh, they appeal to a wide range of different people through different uh, songs and musical styles. That they, that Did you sing along to National Express? Of course, you've got Good. to do that. Yeah, you've Good. got to do that. Yeah. Um, Arse is the size of a small country. You know, yeah. you, you yeah, no, kind of beat lyrics like that. So, yeah, really good fun. Um, and uh, that's about it, really. Oh, yes, I moved house. Oh, yeah. How could I time. forget that? Um, so, But you'll be thinking, well, hang on. Phil, you're still in the same office that you're normally in. Well, yes, uh, we're keeping this on for the time being, and I'm still going to be working here. Uh, but in terms of living, I no longer live in this building. Uh, we moved at the weekend. We've gone into what's probably best described as a retirement bungalow, yet neither of us have retired, but it's uh, it suits us and it suits our needs at the minute. So uh, everybody knows how stressful um, moving house is. So, uh, so yeah, it's been a full-on week. Uh, and of course, I, I injured myself, so I couldn't walk for a couple of days, and you know the usual, the usual. As you do. So, Ed, what have you been up to? Um, uh, compared to that, nothing of any note at all. The the only thing I've done different to usual is that I cut down a tree, um, which, as you might imagine, with my standard sort of um, aptitude for practical tasks, um, I didn't destroy anything or injure myself. But that was more a matter of luck or judgment more than, than 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 actual skill. So um, yes, I cut a tree down. I mean, it doesn't make a huge difference to my garden, but I, I think it's no longer going to undermine my house. So I mean, that that was about the most exciting non-work related task that I've attended to since I last spoke to you. Uh, I mean, that's a tragic reflection on my existence. But there we are. <laughs> um, otherwise, the only other thing that is of note, regular listeners will, will, will remark on this as being a singular event. Gentlemen, on Thursday, I am off to the cinema. Oh, um, okay. So, I mean, I figured if you are going to watch Top Gun 2, I hope it's IMAX that you. Got. Yeah, I'm watching it on the largest, loudest you screen have to do that. available. You have to do that. It, it, so it's the I, law. Yeah, well, this is the thing. I think you know it is an event film. It needs to be seen in event settings. So on Thursday, I will be going to the cinema for the first time since Dune. Um, um, yeah, there's no fixed date for when I'll go after that. So yeah, you know, it's a rare and beautiful moment in my existence. Um, but it's pre-booked seats. I'm sure it will be busy but I'll just have to rock backwards and forwards and deal with it in my own special way. So, um, yeah, that's that's the, the highlights of my existence at this point. Excellent. Well, that's what we've all been up to. Uh, we've given you a rundown of what's coming up tonight, so let's get on with the show. We'll be back in a sec with hardware. If you'd like to support the AV Forums podcast on a regular basis, then why not become a patron? Head over to patreon.com forward slash AV Forums to sign up. You can also make a one-off donation through the Super Chat or via streamlabs.com forward slash AV Forums. All donations help us to improve the website and the podcasts. Thank you to all our supporters. So let's start the show with current competitions. What can we win, Ed? 
It's just the one on the go, but it is a doozy. Uh, you can win the Valencia Single Tuscany Black Cinema Seat worth £1,399 and 99p. To enter, head over to avforums.com forward slash competitions and all competitions, excuse me, are open to eligible AV Forums members resident in the UK. We don't have any previous winners at the moment, but I am sure that there will be some in the fullness of time. Okay, thank you very much for that, Ed. Uh, if you fancy winning that, get yourself uh, entered. Right, let's move on. We've got some AV news to get through. Uh, so let's ho- head over to Ian. Uh, let's do hardware first. So AV hardware, uh, what's in the news? Uh, well, obviously there would be lots of Panasonic talk, but um, yeah. you've more than got that covered. Uh, so a couple of other things that are of interest. Um, Sonos announced the new Ray soundbar. Uh, which comes in at £179, so it's cheaper than the likes of the Arc and its other models. Uh, but subsequently, that means it comes with a few less bells and whistles. So it's kind of one of those interesting payoffs between, you know, whether you're happy to, to pay less and not have things like Dolby Atmos or uh, HDMI and whether you know, whether Sonos can deliver the same high quality that it does in its other products at this cheaper price point. So it'd be quite interesting to see how that pans out. Okay, good stuff. And we've got a review coming up of that. Um, that'll be Simon Lucas's second review for us. So um, if you haven't seen the new reviewers on AV Forums and head over to the, the homepage, there are reviews up there. So John Archer and Simon Lucas have both joined the team recently. Um, great to have them on board. And they're going to be producing a lot of home AV reviews for us in terms of sound bars and speakers and all that kind of goodness. So uh, keep your eyes on the homepage for those new reviews. Uh, anything else? Uh, AV wise, Ian? Um, yeah, LG Display um, showed off their 97 inch OLED X TV at a, an event in California, which unfortunately I couldn't make myself. Um, yeah, whether there's any real need for a 97 inch OLED X TV, um, time will tell. Um, not a great deal more was given about it in terms of the specs or obviously pricing, so we can't divulge too much more. But it does, I mean, it certainly looked the part, and quite literally, it's very hard to miss. Yeah, uh, when you see a screen of that size, um, yeah. even if it is from the comfort of my living room rather than being out in sunny California. Um, so, yeah, it was just interesting to see, obviously, because it's LG display rather than LG electronics, who actually adopts it, whether it actually hits the market uh, and just how good the, the OLED X it is, technology it is, is going coming. to be. Uh, it is coming in the lineup this year. Um, it's going to be on one of the models this year. So from LG electronics. So that, that screen is coming. Um, in 97 inches. Whether Dude, you can afford it, it or it would not. fit through my door. Yes, it will, Ed. It will fit through a door. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, that's a start. I, I haven't seen your door, so I don't know if it's your <laughs> Oh, yeah. By the way, I live in one of those hobbit houses that Peter Jackson got. No, I don't. <laughs> it's no. It, it, um, yeah. It, it yeah. just it, just the logistics of it. And then uh, it's basically a glowing wall, isn't it? Yeah. When it yeah when but it's I mean, the, the thing is. Um, you know, we're moving into the digital age, whether we like it or not, as film fans and so on. Um, projected image is it, it's always an image that I prefer, um, because it is a, a reflected image. It has a certain um appeal to it. It has a certain texture and and so on that you can't get from a direct view TV. Um, but everything's heading for HDR grades now. Directors are actually thinking about you know what it is that they're they're producing and and the different. Um, markets that are open to them. I mean, you've seen a lot more IMAX and so on as well, um, which was considered to be a dead format uh, only 10 years ago. So, um, you know, things are moving on. And if you can get a 97-inch screen that can do a 1,000 nits and uh, give you an HDR image uh, with accurate colour and so on, does that appeal to you, Uh, Jules, or are you old school uh, like myself yeah you know we're probably we're of a similar age aren't we phil um yeah. we have a sort of a nostalgic um feel for projected images and um yeah i, I prefer that i mean and the, the other main issue is that most film content is still you know got a 2.4 to 1 aspect ratio and yeah. the forums are full of people complaining about why why don't films films fill my whole screen you know i bought this big tv and there's great big black bars on them so until they can solve that one, I mean, Philips did try, didn't they, a few years back with their CinemaScope TV? But bless mm. them. I mean, it just ignored the fact that it looked very weird when you were <laughs> watching. <Yeah. laughs> it didn't right, didn't work right for TV. So yeah, um, but, but hey, kudos to them for trying at the time. No, absolutely, I mean, we're, we're, yeah. we're in a marketplace now where people just won't take risks like that. So 
Um, so yeah, I think you'll only see a twenty-one by nine screen. Um, probably gaming monitors is the last uh, part of the market where you're going to see that kind of ratio these days. I, I don't think we'll see it on a TV again, just for the reasons you've just said there, Jules. Normal TV, you're going to have the black bars at the side rather than at the tops and bottoms. So we should yeah. just film everything in four by three, just to annoy everybody. <laughs> well, that's, you know, you. It, I know you just said that in jest, but a lot of these professional cameras and a lot of cameras now, um, people are choosing to use the full sensor and then mask it off or matter it off in, in such a way that um, suits them in terms of aspect ratio and what the, how they want to tell the story. And and in the past, I've, I've, I've scoffed at that, but it's becoming more and more prevalent. And um, one of the cameras that we are going to hopefully start using at AV Forums, a GH6 from Panasonic, um, it's full sensor. It's a micro four thirds, but the full sensor is a four by three. It's a five point seven k sensor, um, and uh, you know it's a, it, everything on there is ten bit or above. So this is the future that we're heading to, and and people are utilizing that aspect ratio. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see. I, I just like Zack Snyder, Justice back. League. Yeah, I I would not be surprised if we see a little bit more uh, of of that. Um, you know, changing some of the aspect ratios, changing, and some of us old timers are, are going to have to um, suck it up. I think uh, when it comes to these younger directors and what they want to, what they want to do, it's, as long as they don't go vertical, um, I'm, I'm all right with. It. I'm all right with artistic intent. Let's <laughs> put it that aspect way. Ratio. Yeah, uh, but anyway, ninety-seven inch TV. Um, if you could fit it in your room, if you could afford it, because uh, it's going to be very, very expensive to start with. Um, yeah. It'll appeal to some. I mean, Panasonic used to do a 150-inch plasma. Um, and but that also was... doubled as a complete heating system for yeah. a home. So, yeah. um, and uh, one former Chelsea owner had three on his yacht. So Which yeah. sack? Under the weight. Right, so thanks for the AV news. Uh, Ian, what are we doing hi-fi? Well, Munich show has been on, so I'm going to guess we're going to talk about Munich and round it up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was the high end show that I, I keep mispronouncing or miscalling the high fi show when <laughs> it, it pretty much is. Um, but yeah, obviously, it was a very busy week. Uh, show ran from uh, uh, middle of last week through to the, well, I think it finished over the week, course of the weekend. Yeah, so uh, evening. And obviously, not only is it a great showcase event, it's also a very convenient time for people to announce new products. Um, so there's been a lot of stories up on the website. I won't go into all the details now, but I would advise anybody who hasn't been on the site for a, a few days, it'd probably be a good time just to check in because there's a lot of stories. I'll run through some of the just the, the headline products for you now. Um, only in the order that I wrote them, as far as I can recall. Um, Macintosh launched a new MCD 12,000 CD player. Uh, Marantz also reconfirmed its commitment to the CD format with the CD60 player. Um, Astel and Kern announced both a new CanMax digital audio player and some Pathfinder earphones. Focal and Name have teamed up again uh, for a new all-in-one system, um, comprising both of their products. Uh, Sony announced new Link Buds S earphones, uh, while the likes of Audio Technica, TNA and Clear Audio also showed off new earphones or headsets. Uh, quite an interesting one with Triangle, unveiling a new active series of its Boria. Um, yeah, hopefully, going to get those in. So, yeah, um, yeah. That, that was an interesting one because I didn't expect it. And the normal Borea is excellent. So, yes, I sent an email when the release came in. And yes, very much so. Yeah, and they did look good. Um, I mean, the only other couple of things I had on my list uh, iFi Audio gave us a new portable DAC Go Bar, complete with a really excessively shiny gold plated finish to mark the company's 10 year anniversary. Um, that's pretty much all I could point to the likes of Kef LS60 wireless speakers that were announced before all of this that are also worth going onto the website to take a look at. But all in all, very busy week, hi fi wise. So I don't know if you guys, if any of those products stood out for you or you caught your eye that you want to have a look at in even more detail, such as the triangle speaker. And I've got to say, uh, as a market segment, the, the, there is a, a real bounce in the step. Uh, with a lot of these hi-fi manufacturers at the minute, lots of new and interesting products, Ed. Well, they're, yeah, they're, we've got to be careful here because a lot of them are flush with cash after lockdown and they need to be careful. I've been saying this for two years now, that they need to be aware that a lot of people brought purchases forward during lockdown and they won't be making those purchases over the next few years. Yes, yeah. 
But um, nevertheless, there was some really good stuff. There are some patterns. The Macintosh and Morant CD players are interesting. Um, what we're seeing is a smaller number of companies really sort of digging back in to optical disc because there is still a demand for it. And with a reduced number of people making products, they um, they feel that they can do good numbers with it. Um, so it's going to be interesting to watch these evening years of CD, because if you told me that Macintosh and, and uh, Marantz in particular would, would be releasing new players in 2022, I'd have been quite surprised by that. So there is more to come. And we've actually got a CD player review in the tank ready to go up live on the site um so yeah uh, there is more more to give there um other patterns uh there is i need to have, explain this in a way without it sounding either jingoistic or overstating what's going on but a number of the launches um uh company fine audio whose products we've looked at uh, announced two ranges of speakers um uh, and they're coming back from Chinese production. They are going to be built in the UK. Uh, there was a new little mission, the same as uh, same sort of styling as, as the 770. We just reviewed the 700. That's also going to be built in the UK. Two new Wharfdales that we've built in the UK across different markets. High-end hi-fi is coming back to its country of origin. So it's not just a back to the UK thing. It's a back to Europe thing. It's a back to the US thing. It's a back to Japan thing. Um, I don't want to read some great political insight into that. Um, I just think that people are starting to, customers are starting to become more engaged with where their products actually come from. And I do think that people are responding to that. Um, and obviously there was some really, really silly stuff as well. Project has made a really scary looking metal turntable in the shape of the Metallica logo, which looks like it will have a toddler's <laughs> eye out in about, 30 seconds. Um, Vertair, the people that supplied the Christmas extravaganza turntable that I ended up buying, released a new tone arm, not a record player, a tone arm. Gentlemen, how much do you think that tone arm costs? 30 grand. It's a good start. Anyone else? Any any, any other takers? It's going to be more than that then, is it? <laughs> I'm not saying anything. I'm just a good pound 50. I'm going low, just so I'm at the other end of the street. <laughs> just again, it's like 50 grand. Are. Well, it, it sits between Mr. Hinton and Jules. It is forty-three thousand pounds for an arm. So, uh, I mean, there's wow. still there's still some serious stuff breaking cover, and there was some Dan D'Agostino stuff which had lottery price tags as well. That's what Munich is good for. Uh, it was really heartening to see. Um, there was much more stuff than I anticipated. I had made the decision not to go. I do somewhat regret that. I will try not to repeat that mistake next year. Um, but no, it was it was a good outing. There was some some really decent product breaking cover. And there's one last Munich story, which I'm going to cover when I talk about an upcoming review in a couple of minutes as well. Okay. I think that wraps up uh, Munich. Um, so like uh, Ian was saying, if you want any more details, you want to get in depth with this stuff, then all the news stories is up there. Um, you'll find it on the homepage if you uh, click on the editorial and then you can click on Hi-Fi News and that should bring up uh, everything that you're looking for. And uh, once you're in the stories, actually, if you click on the, um, the tag for Munich, it should bring up all the Munich stories that have been tagged as Munich. So there you go. Um, right. Uh, yeah. It, it sounds good whether it, it works that way or not you tell us um right let's move on because ian said uh, there was pan panasonic news there was i went down to london um last week now um on a thursday uh went to the soho hotel which was very nice i uh, felt completely underdressed as always when you go into venues like that um but it was to see the new range um, right off the bat. What I'm going to say is uh, if you've seen the uh, JZ range from last year, um, there is no changes in terms of design. There hasn't been any changes in terms of design um, for the, the last couple of years, certainly three years for the flagship. Uh, the JZ 1500, so it sits underneath the flagship, the flagship being the 2000. Um, again, this year it has no speakers uh, on it, so it doesn't have the Dolby Atmos soundbar, it doesn't have the Dolby Atmos upward firing, but it does have the Master OLED Pro panel that the 2000 has. So if you have a home cinema system already, you don't need the Atmos sound system. Uh, the 1500 is a screen for you. And like last year when I tested them, they are identical in terms of picture quality, the 2000 and the 1500. Same panel, same processor, uh, doing exactly the same thing. It's just the sound system's not there. 
Um, there is one new model this year that we didn't see at this launch event. So it was just the OLED screens that we, we saw at the event. Uh, Pre-production samples, there was a 77-inch 2000, um, which looked very impressive. It also looked incredibly heavy. If you've ever lifted a Panasonic um, LZ2000 with those speakers attached to them, um, it's probably the heaviest OLED on the market by some margin. I can only imagine what the 77-inch uh, ways you know, when you try to lift it. Um, thankfully, it can't come through the door here, so I'll, I'm not going to be um, lifting that one myself on my own. But uh, impressive, impressive screen size. Um, very, very good t looking TV. Uh, the 1500 is probably the one personally that I would go for um, if I was looking for a Panasonic. Um, and again, great picture quality. They've got the new processor on there, which has a few updates in terms of what it will do in terms of upscaling and so on, as well as um, they're now looking at color volume. Uh, obviously, Samsung have released the QD OLED, Sony are going to do a QD OLED. There is no QD OLED from Panasonic this year uh, in the lineup. Um, but yes, uh, they said that they have managed to increase the uh, overall color volume, especially with blue by increasing the uh, uh, gradations that are visible within uh, blue and the color of blue. Uh, so it's gonna be interesting to measure up and see exactly what they are doing uh, to try and compete in terms of color volume, which everybody's gonna be talking about this year. Um, so that was interesting. There's also the smaller screen sizes. So uh, the screen sizes for the flagship is 5565. 77 you then got 55 65 for the 1500 but you also have 42 and 48 inch but they do not have the master oled panels they do have the wbe panels um so unlike the lg c2 at 42 inch and 40 uh, 42 inch that didn't have it on initial launch uh, the panasonics will have the latest 2022 uh, panels in there that was confirmed at the time uh, during the event um, so if that is of concern to you, then uh, there you go. That's your answer. Um, and then there's the LZ800, which we didn't see. Now, this one is uh, entry-level OLED. Um, that will be interesting to some uh, listeners and viewers. And the LZ980 is the sort of C2 of the Panasonic range. It does everything as a all the features on there it doesn't have the oled uh master oled pro um panel um only the uh i have completely had a brain fart there um oh yeah and the lg 1000 i knew there was one missing that i hadn't mentioned um is a john lewis special in the uk so it is a retailer exclusive um but it does have a master oled panel just not the pro panel so it does have um, some of the uh, heat dissipation technology but not the full um, 1500 and 2000 model uh, versions of that uh, it's still my home screen for smart tv although uh, intriguingly the lower end models especially the led models will be um, android versions so um that was interesting an interesting move uh, why they went that way so in terms of picture quality sam um, panasonic always knock it out of the park they're going to have real competition this year from samsung um with their qd oled which does things very differently um lg have been incredibly accurate this year as well they've fixed some of their issues in terms of uh, just of a black shadow detail retrieval and so on which uh, they have struggled with uh, previously so this year, in terms of TVs, I've seen a few questions come up already. You know, which screen's better than, uh, is this screen better than that screen and so on. It's incredibly difficult to answer that for you and your specific use case. All I can suggest is that you look at our reviews, you watch our videos, uh, you look carefully uh, at what we're saying, and then you take that information and decide which panel suits you best. Because there are questions like, you know, is the Samsung at 65 inches good as a 77 inch G2? Which one would you have at eight feet seating distance? Well, there's a lot of caveats in there. There's a lot of what LG does very well. Uh, and then the Samsung will do other things better and other things worse. So, you know, there is no catch all. There is no perfect TV, which is why, you know, I think 
Um, it's exciting this year. I'm excited to get stuck into these TVs. I've been really enjoying the Samsung and the LG sitting next to each other here. I've been doing a lot of work um, to make sure that we cover absolutely everything that you guys want to know. Um, but yeah, there's lots more coming. Panasonic looks really interesting. They're always accurate. Um, it's something that they take very, very seriously. Um, they want to give you the best possible picture quality. They haven't gone QD OLED this year, so it's going to be interesting to see what they have done um, in terms of color volume and what they have done in terms of the panel. And they did take a, a bit of time to actually stress what it's not just the panel, it's the processor on top of that uh, and everything that goes with that. So, um, yeah. Stay tuned is what I'd say because we're going to have the, the models turn up as soon as they're available. And we're going to start with the 1500, hopefully, which I think is more suited to the AV Forum's audience. So that was the Panasonic launch. The video is on our YouTube channel of the launch event if you want to have a look at shots of the TVs and so on. I've got to say, I'm still not convinced with the round stand. Um, I know some people said, oh, you know, let it go, Phil. It's not a big issue. Um, for me, it just, I don't know, it makes it look cheap. That's just the way I see it. Uh, I see a round stand on a TV, and I think of a of a cheap Samsung from eight or nine years ago. It, it just doesn't look right to me. But anyway, you know, everybody's different when it comes to design. Um, just make yourself a DIY cardboard. Well, it, around it, for it. If it annoyed me that much, and I owned one, I'd probably get a Visa stand. You know, you, you can get some really nicely designed stands now that you just use the Visa uh, points on the back of the TV and mm. change the stand. Change it stand up so um yeah that was panasonic any questions jules i know you you no i just sort of con con concur with what you said phil i mean it's always a pleasure to to work with panasonic televisions because from a calibrator's point of view you look at the de's on that and it's like you know point two yeah. or sort of yeah. point one it's like wow i mean yeah. you can't see it there's a difference between you know what's the difference between a delta error of 0 0.1 and 0 0.5 nothing visually but it tickles our fancy as a as a calibrator to see that kind of accuracy. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you know, they're one of the companies that did listen when you know we went to them 2010, 2009, 2010, and and said, look, we need these controls on the TVs, and and we weren't the only people lobbying them at the time, but they listened, and they, every year they've they've improved things. So yeah. it's not going to be a huge jump up this year. It never is with TV manufacturers, but it's going to be. Um, entertaining to see what happens I, I tried to think of a word that wasn't interesting because I, I tend to say interesting a lot on this podcast anyway that's panasonic stuff uh, ed you wanted to discuss mark levinson headphones yes um i sense that there will be some outrage in the comment section when this review does go live um Mark levinson has never made a pair of headphones in the time the company has existed uh so their first pair um is news in itself uh then also the nature of the headphones themselves is quite surprising it is a wireless bluetooth noise cancelling headphone of a type that we have tested many models of over the years the most salient difference being that where most of those top out at between 350 and 400 pounds these are yours for 999 pounds which is you know a not inconsequential rise um so I set out to work out if that could possibly be worth it. And the, you know, I won't go into the full details of it because uh, there's something more important to talk about um, in a second. Suffice to say, they are the best wireless headphones I've ever tested. Um, and not, you know, it's not a, a, a tiny margin either. Are they twice as good as the next set? No, of course they're not. That's not that's not how the law of diminishing returns works. Um, but they did do things that genuinely surprised me. Um, and the nature of their design means that, um, I, as with all wireless headphones, I do test them out and about, no matter how preposterously self-conscious I feel doing it. Um, and they're subtle enough that unless you really know what you're looking for, you won't clock that someone has a grand's worth of stuff wirelessly attached to their head. <laughs> so um, it's a gamble that you you will have to make yourself as an owner if you decide to do it or not. But I think they can just about get away with it. And then also they've largely squared away things like how a product of that price point should feel and how um, it should be built. In that review, 
I also said this is either going to be some sort of weird technological blind alley that we'll talk about in, you know, nostalgically going, oh, do you remember when Mark Levinson tried to sell these for a grand? Or <laughs> it's going to be the first of a couple of people going, right, let's do it. And one of the stories that we skipped over at Munich is T plus A, who some of you will recall, we've reviewed some T plus A headphones and they were yours for just £5,000. Um, they've taken some of that same technology um, into uh, a wireless Bluetooth headphone. And what's more, they haven't come in at £999. They have sailed past the £1,000 barrier. And yes, I have requested a review set because I have a sneaking suspic suspicion these are going to be absolutely sensational. What this is indicative of, we have seen this over and over again, both in hi-fi and in multi-channel and indeed in screens. Once someone makes the jump to going, do you know what, let's see if this works. What then follows is either everyone else laughing at them as it bombs or if people going, right, okay, they've done it. They clearly think the numbers are going to work. We're going to do it too. I suspect over the next 12 to 18 months where essentially wireless headphones are topping out, as I say, at £400, we're now going to see a whole new category of extremely high-end devices. Um, and in the Mark Levinson review, I remark on the fact that Bluetooth is good enough for this. Nobody felt that high-end headphones weren't worth it when the highest medium we had was CD. We have Bluetooth formats that are up to the job of giving you approximately that much information. So the technology has been available for a while. It's simply a, a, a mental gap, a mental sort of hold up as to whether it was worth doing. So... The review for the Mark Levinson will be going live sometime in the not too distant future. And um, I hope that the T plus A one will follow as soon as I've got um, got got a sample. Um, and I think that this is going to be something that has legs. And I would be fascinated either in the comments here or for those listening later on, if you could feedback that, you know, is there anyone going to stick their hand up and say, yes, my work or travel basis or how I work uh, with other people actually stands up to me justifying a £1,000 or more pair of wireless headphones. Because at the moment, I obviously, you know, all it's going to be is anecdotes, but at the moment, I genuinely have no data as to whether this is a heroic technical effort for no clientele or there genuinely are people out there for these things. Headphones were legs, who would have thought? <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's one, yes. There you go. <laughs> No, she's not happy about she's not happy about something, that's for sure. Um anyway, uh, that's the uh, Mark Levinson headphones. Uh, look out for them. Right, we need to move things on very swiftly because we've got to do our calibration uh, chat with Jules. Uh, one of the things that keeps popping up, and I think it's probably one of the most important aspects of uh, image quality uh, when it comes to uh, your TV, is white balance, and it's also one of the most misunderstood. Um, aspects of the whole thing is what is white balance and why is it important? Well, Jules, mm -hmm. what is it and why is it important? It is the ring to rule them all when it comes to your picture. It has vast implications for what you're seeing. As you say, it's a balance. It's a white balance and it's a balance of red, green and blue. When you combine red, green and blue together, you will get white to some uh, to some degree. And what kind of white you get depends upon the balance of the red, green, and the blue. So um, stress the blue, you'll get a bluey white, and so on and so forth. Um, so you can have lots of different tints of white, as you'll know if you go down to B&Q and try and find a, a you know, pot of paint. Wife says, go and get me some white paint. And there you are. There's a, uh, you know, there's a whole stack of paint that's all saying it's white, but it's white with an apple tint or whatever. At this, and you can do the same thing with your, your TV as well. You know, if you change that combination of red, green, and blue, you can you can you can do that. And TV manufacturers typically, in their uh, vivid or dynamic modes, will tint their white balance towards blue, because we as humans perceive bluey whites as being brighter. And of course, when you walk into a showroom, they want to catch your eye. Uh, to be the brightest uh, TV you know, in, in the room. That's the one you're going to go and look at. But it's not the white balance that is used within the TV and the movie uh, creative industry. Um, in fact, we use a specific uh, white point, which we call D65, and uh, that has very specific coordinates, XY coordinates, X equals uh, 0.313, Y equals 0.329, um, roughly 
Yeah, well, it is 6,500 kelvins, but that's more of a sort of a, an area than a specific coordinate. So um, the calibrated color temperature or white balance that's used for movie TV production uh, is um, also known as midday luminant because it is the color temperature of the midday sun in the Western hemisphere, uh, both direct and diffused in the sky. And so we use that, um, our source of, of natural light coming from the sun as the specific white point to which all movies and TV programs are created. And it's funny, isn't it, that um, some of the comments that you read are uh, on a calibrated image or filmmaker mode or whatever it is, it, it doesn't look natural. Um, it's, <laughs> well, too, it's too yellow. It's yeah. too warm. Yeah. But it's actually based on, you know, the midday sun. The midday it is sun. Ba exactly. It is based on reality and, and, and looking exactly. natural. Um, the thing is that um, for many years, um, the white point on TVs has been very blue. Yeah. And people don't realize that is the case until mm -hmm. you show them that there's blue and you mention that there's blue and then suddenly people's eyes adjust and yeah, actually I can see the blue mm -hmm. and see why. And, and I, I guess that it gives the impression of white being super white. Yeah. But it's not a natural white. It's not no. actually how white looks. And yeah. uh, a lot of the feedback that we get is, well, it, you know, your snow looks yellow. Yeah, but actually go out and look at snow and mm -hmm. <laughs> under sunlight. It looks yellow. It doesn't mm -hmm. look blue. Yeah. Draw the um, sun. It's not blue. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it, it is one of these points. Now, again, uh, and, and you mentioned it in your reply there that, mm -hmm. you know, the reason manufacturers have different white points is some of it is cultural. Mm -hmm. So certainly uh, in the Far East, in Japan, it's yeah. 9,300 yep. Kelvin. Yep. Is, it always has been. They, they're like a very blue uh -huh. uh, looking white and, and uh, a lot of their TV programs. If you've ever seen clips of the TV programs and some of the game shows and so on, everything's garish, everything's yep. you know, larger than life and so on. And that has been their approach. Um, so for many years when TVs were coming from there culturally, they didn't understand the Western preference mm -hmm. for D65 and, and having mm -hmm. a, a warmer white point and that Hollywood was producing content and TV uh, studios produce content. They all produce it under the same standards envelope, which says you know, what white should look at like. And I guess because we got all these settings on TVs, Jules, um, the, the main fight is that some of these do look initially to the eye incredibly good. You put this Samsung into the vivid mode or the dynamic, mm. I think they call it. Mm. And I can see why people fall for it. Mm. I really can because it's yeah. bright, it's in your face and things look incredibly sharp and all the rest of it. And it's not until you actually start watching something over a, a length of time that you actually realize, well, actually in, in the highlights there, there's no detail. In somebody's face, you've, you've got no lines up here. You know, they look like plasticine models because of how hard the TV is being pushed to, to look a certain way. So, um, again, it's one of these second points that... And of course, they, 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 I mean, and, and people can test this out by simply taking their colour control on their TV down to zero. And you're left with, with the Luma um, part, of the, part of the signal, which is the, the black and white element to the picture. And um, if you just cycle through your TV's color temperature controls going from you know warm to warm one and so on forth normal uh, whatever your tv is you will see the color temperature of that black and white image shifting now then put the color control back on to 50 or whatever it is back to where it was again and do the same thing and you'll see your colors are changing as well so because it's the canvas that underlies your color when you change the tint of the canvas underneath that white that white balance you're also fiddling with your colors. So skin tones, when you add blue to them, shift in the direction of pink. Um, you know, so you are, you can't, there's no point fiddling around with color management controls or color controls until you've fixed your white point. Um, and often you find in a well-designed television, if you if you sorted your white point, then your colors automatically ping into the right place and, and, are, and are very accurate. All right, I'm gonna put you on the spot, Jules. Mm -hmm. uh, two TVs behind me here. We've got the Samsung S95B, which is a QD OLED. And we've got the LG C2. Both of them are 65 inch. Um, 
both of them are set to the filmmaker mode. Now, for anybody uh, interested in filmmaker mode, there are specifications as to what that mode has to be, and it's basically the industry standards. So it has to track D65 white point uh, for SDR and HDR. It has to track uh, the ST2084 for HDR. Um, it has to track BT1886 for uh, SDR. Um, and then the various uh, color gamuts associated with those standards as well. So BT2020, DCI P3 within 2020, and of course Rec 709 for HD. Now, these TVs are both set. Um, they should look identical, especially with white. But even on this camera here, which is very low quality um, camera built into my laptop, you can see that white looks different. They both have different mm -hmm. tints. Explain that to our listeners. Uh and is that on axis or just off axis? Uh, let's just do on axis first because there are other shifts even with OLED, but let's just do on axis first. Well, I mean, there are differences obviously in those in those OLED technologies and uh, pixel stack has, has much to do with the way things look tinted. Uh, there are other issues with the way that certain um, uh, OLEDs are. So for example, RGB OLEDs will look a certain color um, uh, and WOLEDs with the white subpix will also have a different color to them as well. We can call this, there's, there's, a, there's a term for, uh, for this, it's called metamerism. Um, so that is when um, you can uh, use your, your, uh, your colorimeters, your, your measuring devices, and they'll measure the same, but they look different. And um, it's an odd phenomenon. And it's to do with the way that the human brain um, perceives them. Um, and so in post-production studios, for example, when we're working with RGB uh, grading monitors, RGB OLED grading monitors, we will apply an offset to that in order to uh, get it to look uh, D65. Um, so there are differences in the way that, the, that certain uh, technologies uh, look um, by design. And we have to somehow try and sort of deal with that when you are in a studio and you've got an LCD monitor and an OLED and RGB OLED, everything's looking very different, but they measure the same. It's a bit of a, it's a bit of a challenge to get those to be color matched. Um, so there's, there's a few things feeding into that question, Phil, which is just, you know, you know, uh, uh, you know, so um, assuming that, but when you, know, you see this and lots yeah, of YouTubers yeah. are doing side by sides at the minute and putting these videos out and you can see, there are obvious differences. I wanted to cover, cover the, why that is. Even if they're both measured D65, there will be these yep. differences. Yep. Um, and of course, as soon as it, it is a funny phenomenon, because as soon as you move one of them out of the way, uh -huh. you lose the red tint on the yep. Samsung. You move the yep. Samsung out of the way, you lose the cyan tint. You know, your and brain readjusts it. it. Absolutely. The brain is very plastic, very malleable. If you think about your own phone, for example, my, my iPhone has this night mode on it. Everybody does the, you know, the, um, you know, so you don't sort of have the blue light waking you up in the middle of the night. As soon as it goes red, it goes, whoa, you know, it looks horrible. Give it half an hour and it kind of looks normal. Um, so your brain is constantly adjusting to what's in front of you. But where you've got two TVs like you have, that, 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 that difference is constantly being, you're being reminded of it constantly in the same place. Which, as I say, it makes it very difficult calibrating in studios where there are many monitors with different technology types all together in the same place. Um, so it's quite a challenge. Yeah. And it's one of the reasons why you should never jump to conclusions when you're doing cyber side comparisons and, and so on as well. You have to yep. take all of this into account. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it comes down to education. It comes down to experience of the person setting up and also explaining to you what's actually going on. Um, so if you see things in videos like that, ask the questions, you know, what were the TV set to? Have they been calibrated correctly? And, uh, you know, have they been made to look uh, similar or are they actually just the measured results? And, and just quickly, you said on axis, off axis, there are yep. differences there. Um, yep. Just quickly, uh, for our listeners, again, I know the answers to these. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to give you some, some screen time here, but just well, tell us exactly why that is the case. Well, so I think it's down to the, the different the, the, the way that the, the pixels are stacked within within those different display technologies. Um, so um, yeah, they, they they are they are different. Um, and you get that old cyan tint with the with the old uh, with the uh, the WOLEDs, the the LG. Mm -hmm panels um and you get that pinky tink don't you with the sort of the the uh, the newer ones as well so 
Uh, it's just a phenomenon of the way that those those pixels are you know they're, they're stacked stacked within yeah. the within the device. Yeah. So I thought it was a, a very important to to sort of go down this this channel talking about why people are seeing these differences, why it's important, and white mm -hmm. balance is the most important of them all. Uh, the grayscale. Exactly. That is that is what you build your image on, and if it's off, everything else is off. Um, well, and as I said, with a well-designed TV, if you get your white balance correct, the colours will be correct. And grading monitors don't have colour management systems in them. Yeah. Um, and for years, obviously, Sony didn't put theirs in their televisions either. Um, and yeah. the math, it was they were very good. Yeah. Uh, another thing I just want to quickly point out as well, and it's something that I, I bang on about all the time, but James Campbell's just brought up in the comments as well, is that remember, if you're watching a YouTube video, uh, YouTube are putting compression on it. Uh, mm -hmm. The person making the video mm -hmm. has obviously put compression on it. And camera sensors pick up things yep. differently as well. Yeah. Um, so again, we're using a really cheap, uh, it's a 1080 mm -hmm. camera, but it's cheap. It's on an Apple uh, uh, laptop and you're looking at these TVs yep. behind me. Um, they look nothing like that in person. Absolutely. So, Again, uh, I have that problem when I'm trying to sort of uh, put to my Facebook page, you know, this is what I calibrated today on my iPhone 13 Pro Max, whatever it is. <laughs> you know, it takes a yeah, photograph. Yeah. It doesn't look anything like that. Yeah. It doesn't look yeah. anything like that yeah. at all. So just bear that in mind when you're watching yeah. video content and so on. Listen to what's actually being explained. That's that's the most important part. Um, right. Okay. So we've covered that. We're doing well for time. So I think we should bring back uh, an area of the podcast uh, to hardware, which we used to do a lot and we've had a lot of feedback um, in comments and so on saying we really miss you guys talking about what you're actually watching uh, on your systems. You guys talk about your systems all the time, but what is it you're actually watching and what, what should we watch? Um, for a TV review, I very rarely watch TV. Hmm. <laughs> I watch the same things on on cycles. I, I know what they look like and you know when you're assessing TVs. But it's a big week in TV this week. Uh, especially if you're a sci-fi fan. And I know most of our uh, listeners and viewers are sci-fi fans. I'm really excited for Friday. Um, we have two uh, big series coming. So we have on Disney Plus, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Oh. Uh, Ewan McGregor back. Uh, anybody excited for this, apart from me? Is he on a motorbike? No. No, that's the other one. I'm <laughs> willing is. to give it a go. Um I, I just, I don't know. Um, I mean, I have to be honest, I found the book of Boba Fett to be fairly disappointing. I did. But... It, it, it basically turned into Mandalorian 2.0, didn't it? Um... Well, yeah, it, it, as I say, I am not. I wasn't convinced by that. I'll give it, I mean, I've got, still got a blooming Disney subscription lurching onwards, yeah, yeah. so yeah, why not? I'll give that a whirl. Yeah. Um, and of, course, the, of course, the other one is Stranger Things 4. Well, I oh, never watched anything other than halfway through season one so that's All right. really okay. but i have to be honest they are extracting the michael uh, with some of the episode lengths on this they, they just look preposterous the chances of me sitting and watching episodes that long are somewhere between slim and none yeah uh kenobi is anybody else interested in this or am, am i the only one just really really flying like jules yeah, well, I, I I like Star Wars kind of stuff, but I don't get to watch it because I'm in a household where that kind of thing is not uh, welcome. So right. um, we just end up with some G Judy Dench or something like that in you know in some drama. Yeah, but you know, you've got the demo facility there. You could just say, you know, I'm I'm off to yeah. make sure that this projector's calibrated because I've got a client coming, yeah. and you could just sit and watch it there. Yeah, You're right. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And yet he still doesn't. <laughs> Take well, with you. I did watch The Northman um, the, other, the other night. Oh, right. I saw that was up for Reynolds. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. Good. I'll catch that when it's free. Not paying for it. Um, you pay subscriptions anyway. Why, why pay for well, it? Well, it depends I, I, if you I, want to go above and beyond, doesn't it? Um, yeah, it does. I haven't m methodically watched anything since Slow Horses ended. I thought that was absolutely sensational. I can't wait for more than that. Uh, more of that. That's on Apple TV. Um, I did watch quite a few of the Roger Moore era Bond films on Amazon because they are included in the subscription. <laughs> yeah. And I, those are the Bonds I grew up with. I mean, I'm, as far as I, I don't want real world villains. I want a man with a space station. Can we be very clear about this? This is how Bond films should work. Yeah, um, I, I've finally got round to watching, because uh, obviously the new one's on there uh, as part of Prime now as well. So uh, I finally got round to watching that. Didn't like it? No, I wasn't a fan. Was not. I, I had a I had a lump in my throat at the end. Did you? Mm. No, okay. 
Yeah. As I say, not enough space stations or submersible battle palaces. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's you know. what's missing. You know what I mean? Really bad models and all the rest. You know. So, and I, <laughs> I, I obviously, if we're going back to Bond revisiting uh, this Bond revisiting the Aston era, I want the next one to drive a semi-quality restored Lotus Esprit around, you know, so maybe halfway through the door falls off or, you know, just, just something with a bit of, you know, a bit more sort of 70s chic to what's going Not on. Not a Citroen CV1. Well, well you know, that was, I suppose, yeah, you could bring the special attendance vehicles back, but no, I think a, a, an Esprit with the full turbo motif graphics on there as well. I mean, it's just so tight. Well, I'd say timeless. It is extremely of its moment, but it's yeah. magnificent. Um, yeah. But no, other than that, I haven't watched... I mean, I turn things on and sort of have things glowing whilst I eat food, but I have read more books and listened to more music in the last couple of months than than I have gone anywhere near the television. I mean, you guys will know this off the top of your head. You know when the LG um, OLEDs do that funny wipe thing after a given period of time? Yeah. They do. Um, yeah. Uh, and there's, you know, most people have gone, oh, mine's done like three or four. I mean, I got mine in early 2018 and it's done one. <laughs> <laughs> so i'm not a high miler when it comes to television stuff so yeah but you okay. knew that ian uh well I, I don't have disney plus so everyone's off the cards for me in the immediate future but i did that thing with star wars where i got like a film behind and then suddenly 20 things came out and i was kind of lost in the, the whole scheme of it same with the the avengers films where i'm I, I wouldn't know where to start to start playing. Catch well, you, you start by getting a Disney Plus subscription because they're all on there. This is what I did. Uh, the Avengers stuff, I was completely yeah. out of the, the whole Marvel thing. I And I sat um, two weekends in a row and watched them all in order. Um, so I was completely up to date with that. And, and again, all the Star Wars stuff's on there. Um, the only thing yeah. I haven't done is animation. The animation stuff, I've never gotten around to you know, Rebels and so on. Never actually got into. I mean, there is this tiresome requirement to earn money and socially yeah. interact and stuff like that, which kind of puts the damper. <laughs> yeah, there is completionism that, for television. So yeah, got to walk the dog. Uh, right, anything you've been watching, Jules, that you want to tell us about before we finish tonight? Um, yeah, well, it's Churchill's Secret Warriors. I think I was watching on Netflix the other day. Just okay. got into it. You know, it's probably some old. BBC thing where they get people off the streets and make them into SOE agents, but it's I find it really entertaining, you know. Okay, right? so well, there, um, there you go. There's a recommendation for a, a wet Wednesday afternoon if you're stuck at home. Um, right, so that's what we've been watching. Um, we'll try and watch some stuff. So we so this section, yeah, you know, got something to talk about because it looks like not a lot of us. Well, Ed 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 normally talks about records, and that's what he's going to do right now. Mm to wrap up tonight because we're going to talk about records and vinyls and that kind of thing the vinyl hi-fis. the plural of vinyl is vinyl can we be very <laughs> clear about this please i just thought did no, that a little just, bit okay. just knock yourself don't. out ed what's what's this week's picks right album of the week is uh smile a light for attracting attention you may not have heard of smile but you've almost certainly heard of tom york um the Radiohead frontman has done a number of solo projects over the years. This is the first one he's done with Johnny Greenwood, who is also from Radiohead. Now, I there's statistically going to be at least some Radiohead fans listening to this during the course of the time this podcast is 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 sort of live as the as the new one. I'm going to say something contentious here. I do quite like Radiohead. Uh, but that doesn't appear to be a tolerable margin for most people. You're supposed to worship Radiohead. Um I personally feel that because they are so determined to be to not repeat an album style each time, this becomes a weight that they cannot shift. This exercise here, a light for attaching attention, is free from that constraint, and it is magnificent. This is absolutely brilliant to listen to, um, and I cannot recommend it highly enough. Uh, it's really, really um, beautifully put together. Um, I can't remember the name of the drummer. I'm doing him a disservice. He's not the standard radio head drummer. There's a far more sort of jazz element to some of the work that's being done here. I have ha- listened to this time and time again. I think it is a genuinely sensational album. The reason it is not the vinyl release of the month is because the vinyl is not available yet. You can order it, but it hasn't turned up. And I couldn't tell you if it is any good from a hole in the ground. So the vinyl release of the month is from the Black Keys. It is uh, called Dropout Boogie. I'm just going to stick it in front. 
very quickly so people watching um the reason why this is the vinyl release of the month one it's a cracking album uh really really good um but it is mastered by one of the uh people who is in the black keys dan Auerbach, has set up his own record label called eagle eye sound uh and they take uh mastering and editing re really really seriously now um, when you cinema types talk about film grain and things like that, the way that this is recorded, it's not a perfect recording because this music should not be perfectly recorded. It is, um, it, it's a clean-ish recording and it's really very good quality, but it just has enough grubbiness, enough muckiness to sound as it should. And there's some really good tracks on it. I've thoroughly enjoyed listening to it. Both the Smile and the Black Keys albums are obviously available um, on all major streaming services and on CD. But um, if you are looking to buy a record this week, it would be that one for me. It's absolutely brilliant. Uh, and playlists, because the two albums are very musical, the playlist is not. Um, this is Cobuzz doing some historical stuff. They have a playlist called it, The Pioneers of Electronics. Now, I remind you that early electronic music you probably wanted to put an asterisk after the word music because it's debatable quite how much fun this is. There's a lot of stuff on here, which basically sounds like someone just hitting things with hammers, but without these people, without some of the sounds from the, you know, from the very late sixties onwards, we wouldn't be where we are today. Um, so it's more of an interesting history lesson than it is something that you want to sing along to. But nevertheless, if you want to learn a little bit more about some of the people that got us to where we are now, it's a really, really good playlist. And I, I, I think it's, it, it's worth maybe not three hours, eight minutes of your time. You don't want to listen to all of it in real time, but it's certainly worth tinkering about with this if you are a Cobus subscriber. That's me. Excellent. Sorry, the dog's just gone mental because there's now a dog barking outside, so she's going absolutely. Anyway, it's time for us to wrap up tonight. Um, very quickly, I have been looking through the questions. Um, there, um, there have been some. I'm going to quickly go through them. So uh, Mark Tallon was asking about Panasonic and Sony. Will they release new 4K Blu-ray players? I very much doubt we'll see uh, any new 4K Blu-ray players coming to market. Um, it's just one of those things, unfortunately. We've, we've kind of reached a plateau with that, and What's in the market is selling in very yep. small numbers. You're not going to see uh, much more. Streaming definitely is uh, is taken over there. Um, very quickly, could do a 21 by 9 rollable LG. Um, the 16 by 9 rollable LG is a hundred thousand um, pounds. I don't see that being Bargasm. very popular. Um, <laughs> maybe in the, the very distant future. Um, I own a Sony A80J. My question to you is the Panasonic OLED better than the A80J? That's the type of question that you just can't answer, unfortunately, because your idea of best is maybe not the same as my idea of best. Oh. And again, it's about um, the finer details of things. So AV, We're going to sit firmly on the fence on that. Yeah, one. AG006, uh, I'm, I'm not going to put anything into, into that. Read the reviews. Everything's there. Um, read what, what you want into that. Which one fits what you want in terms of a use case and pick that one um there is no thing as a perfect display or or or, or so on so again very very difficult to answer those kind of questions um with any real authority to be honest i can give you a subjective opinion um and i think that was it for tonight's questions uh, from the live chat so thank you very much for taking the time if you have been uh, watching us live if you are listening a little bit later in the week um, and you have a question that you would like to ask us, uh, whether that's uh, watching the video version a bit later or the audio version, then you can send us an email to podcast at avforums.com. Um, we will look at those and we will put them into the next following podcast and answer those. If you are on YouTube, you could go into the, uh, the chat area underneath the comments section and leave your question there. Um, and when we see it, we'll pick it up. And again, next podcast, we'll uh, ask those questions. So in terms of future podcasts, we are back again on the 13th of June uh, for the next Hardware and Movies and then following that the 27th of June. So we're back in June. 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 13th. Yeah, no. Yeah. We haven't, we haven't had much of the weather recently, have we? So anyway, 13th of June, 27th of June. Um, Come and join us again then. Uh, obviously, uh, we've got other podcasts and so on. Um, but my thanks to Ian, Jules, and Ed. 
thank you very much, guys. And coming up next, of course, is the Movies Podcast. Good evening and welcome to the AV Forums Movies Podcast. Today we're going to go, be going to Top Gun. Um, with me for this ride of our lives, I have Mark Costello. You can be my wingman. <laughs> and Simon Crust. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he didn't even do the line, Si. I mean, no, I've on. only seen the film once and it was pants. Only what? Seen Top Gun. Anyway, we'll get yes, into that. Yes, in we bit. will. Yes, we will. First, we'll talk current competitions, <laughs> won't we, Mark? Before we get into the controversy of only seeing Top Gun. I don't know if I can after that. I want to get. <laughs> no, no, yes, you're right. Uh, so, yes, you can win Stephen King's Cat's Eye on 4K and a number of Blu rays, including Around the World in 80 Days, The Terror Colon Infamy, uh, Wormwood Apocalypse, which is all kinds of awesome. Uh, Uncharted and Criterion's May titles. So head over to avforums.com forward slash competitions to enter. All competitions are open to eligible AV Forums members resident in the UK. Awesome. Uh, previous competition winners, Flip Fellow won the podcast exclusive, Nicholas Cage's Pig on Blu-ray. Uh, Cara Wood won Rules of the Game on DVD. Over the Fence won Days of Bagnold Summer on Blu-ray. Loads awesome. Yes, it had your top pick, didn't it, a while back? Awesome film. Low Slan won the new Scream on 4K. Uh, Bopper won, won a copy of Belfast on Blu-ray. Becky I won a copy of Dear Evan Hansen on Blu-ray. Oh, dear. <laughs> Crown won the podcast exclusive X-Men Cerebro collection on Blu-ray and 3D Blu-ray. Well done, all. So, they still make 3D Blu-rays. Yeah, it's, wow. it's amazing. Yes, I know. I know. I, is I that why you're wearing those glasses? It Are we in be. 3D? Yeah, no, it's because I haven't slept. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've also got a uh, podcast exclusive to win a copy of Top Gun on 4K. Um, so stay tuned to the end to get the question for that that you need to answer the really easy mm. answers on that. Um, Top Gun Maverick. Top Gun Maverick. So I take it only 50% of us are actually excited about this. I am, sir. I am, sir. I'm very excited. I've got to somehow sell Simon on this. Well, you uh, did show me the uh, the trailer. I did, um, yeah. When, it did look good. Over a couple of weeks ago, and it did look good. Um, and uh, I am being taken to see it uh, Ooh. next on Sunday, actually. Very nice. So I am going to see it in an everyman theatre with a nice big relaxing chair and a huge pint of beer. Very nice. You won't, you won't make it till takeoff. It'll be fast <laughs> asleep, feet up, <laughs> dribble coming down the side of his chin. That's it. That's why he's going. Comfy nap. <laughs> I need a nice kit. <laughs> I've, I've seen a lot of films at the cinema over the years, and there have only been a few landmark experiences. And I would, much as the story was absolutely pants, and I'm not necessarily looking forward to the follow-up, I would say Avatar was one of them. Seeing Avatar in 3D mm. was one of those experiences. Uh, and even for those that don't rate the first film and have no particular love going into the to Top Gun Maverick, um, it is a hell of an experience. Mm. It's, I was lucky enough to get to see the charity premiere, which was same time as the royal premiere. We got footage from the from the red carpets and interviews from the main cast and the director, uh, which ended in Cruise, which was pr particularly interesting because I guess he's pushing 60 now. And they talked to him about the movie and he no longer came across as a film star. He came across as a filmmaker, um, more so possibly even than Joe Kaczynski, the director. He, he uh, Cruz talked uh, in considerable depth about how he prepared him and the rest of the cast for the film, um, how he took everybody out because he flies. He flies his, I think he's got a prop plane which is seen in the movie. Um, and he's, he's a really good pilot in that. So to prepare them for going up in supersonic 
fighter planes. He took took them all out in that. Uh, he told them how they have to look towards the camera and how they have to behave towards the camera whilst in flight because it's a part of the process and it has to work right for editing. And then once they were comfortable with that, they took them out in the proper planes. Um, I have to say, watching the end result, it, it's, uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's a hell of an experience. It's, as you can see from the Zoom background, I mean, they put you in the plane. Uh, I saw it in IMAX, and I would make a series of recommendations if you're going to go and watch this movie, which I would recommend everybody does. Firstly, they should probably re-watch Top Gun if they're not familiar with it, Simon. Uh, it, is a, uh, it is a direct continuation, and the director, Joe Kaczynski, has gone to great lengths to make it look and feel like a Tony Scott movie with modern filmmaking capabilities and uh, and modern sensibilities. You know, it doesn't it doesn't completely look like that, but you know, the sunsets are there and the music's there and the uh, all you need, all you need, air, aircraft porn is there. <laughs> um, the the other thing is it, it its core rests upon events that took place in the first movie. And so it is much like a lot of films we've seen. I would look to things like Ghostbusters, Afterlife, but it's very nostalgic. But they find a way of repeating almost all the same beats, except twinged with a hint of melancholy because of what happened in the first movie, which still haunts Maverick in this one. What, losing that beach volleyball game, that second set? Yeah. Is, is it that that haunts him? It is. Also. So, do you know what he, he's running probably, out of baby oil? Uh, that's like, it. His, his regret is, I can't believe I went to Kelly McGillis's house and I didn't have a shower. That's his <laughs> regret. <laughs> that's what's haunted him for thirty years. It was, uh, yes, it was. It, it, it's it's quite impressive how they managed to do everything they did in the first movie again, only with uh, more gravitas. Um, it. it, 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 it I don't want to. I don't want to spoil anything, but basically, almost everything that happens in the first movie happens again, but happens with with some a melancholy, poignant twinge to it that gives it a heart. Um, Cruise is aces, uh, and if you're forgetting all of that because you didn't come here for the story and the characters and the performances and all the rest of it, the we I don't think in at least in our lifetimes we'll we'll get. A spectacle like this again. Uh, it, I don't think we had anything since Top Gun. I, I know there were other sort of knockoffs, and I know they, you know, we, we got uh, stealth on the CG front, but no one's had the permission perhaps to, to get in planes and do this kind of stuff, and maybe no one's had the balls to do it. Um, but having crews sit in a plane while it's Pulling off some crazy maneuvers, uh, it, it's it's quite an experience. And kind of midway through the film, there's a there's the scene which is probably the highlight of the film for me, and you can see the punishment he's taking doing those moves. Even though he's not flying the thing, it looks like he's flying it, and he sure as hell is going through the speed of the turns and you're right there for the ride on the clock for the ride. Um, I, I think that it's spectacular and I recommend everyone see the first one again. So they tie it in nicely and go and see this on the biggest IMAX screen you can find. It's, can you just sit closer? Yeah, maybe you could, <laughs> maybe you could, but really go see it smack in the center, biggest IMAX you find you'll be there in the movie. It's, um, it's really, it's really fabulous. I'm, I'm already, I'm trying to double up because I got already booked to see it another four times. Wow! And I'm trying to get some of the people to go together because I, I think I can do maybe three more, but four is maybe pushing it. Um, <laughs> Cas Harlow, brought to you by Paramount Pictures. Yeah, tell you what. Anyway, I yes, highly recommend it. Absolutely. F fantastic it's and interesting. I, I, um, I didn't think much of the first film um, 
as I just said bef before we come on air, whenever it was I said it, I never really did. It was it was okay. Um, too cheesy, too I don't know, daft, too eighties. Um, but that, I guess that was the whole point. That was, yes, yes. So, this so, is no. Gee, it is. what? This is. Yes, it was. It, was, it, was it is awful. all of these things. I mean, that line. You can be my wingman anywhere. I mean, yeah. my God, that's just unbelievable. I feel the need. The need um, for speed. Yeah, um, I do have a little bit of respect for it now, though, because I, I, I watched um, not in preparation for this, but in in knowing that I was going to go and see the film. Um, a uh, an internet what the hell happened to this movie um, video talking about the the making of it. So it's done independently. It's not a Paramount production done by someone else. And they, apparently they went through the ringer to get this thing made. It yeah, was they must quite. Have it was yeah. quite a, a feat to get it made. And in fact, because I mean, Tony Tony Scott had his um, his ideas of what he wanted to do. Uh, Don Simpson and Brockheimer, they had their ideas of what they wanted to do. The Navy had their ideas of what they wanted them to do. And mm. to mesh those three things together to get the film made, because Cruz was a nobody at that time. He was just he coming was, up, wasn't yeah. he? he? It's he was really interesting. Yeah, um, is, so yeah. Um, they, he, he was just coming off. Um, it was legend, wasn't it? That, that, he was, so yeah. just, that was the film you just made prior to that. So he was virtually a nobody. Yeah. Um, and he commanded a million dollars and he got it. Unbelievable. Yeah. I digress. But anyway, they... Um, they got this thing made and they had to use all of the aerial footage, everything, because there wasn't <laughs> enough coverage to get a, a full film. Yeah. And they tried to do what they what they tried, what they've got this time, which is them in the cockpit showing them going all the G's. They tried to do that 30 years ago, but they couldn't do it. The camera technology wasn't there and everyone was puking up in the planes, so they couldn't use any of it. So they yeah. had they had uh, green screen stuff. I believe I can't. Remember. Yeah, yeah, they did. Yeah, yeah, it was all green screen stuff because they couldn't use real footage. So this time they obviously trained them properly, put them in the suits, got them ready, get out there. We're going to show you. What they look what like really they are like. suffering. Mm. I'm not kidding. Uh, some, I mean, C Cruz looks like he is taking a degree of punishment, but some of the cadets, uh, they're not cadets, they're all Top Gun graduates, but like some of them look like they're, they're really. They're in it like a screen movie. They're I can believe it. suffering in that. You I can, can mostly it. just see like eyes popping out of skulls. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, and you can visibly see a bit like uh, I think in Moonraker when Roger Moore gets yeah. spun around the centrifuge, mm -hmm. you can see the skin going back on their faces as they're pulling G's. I mean, it's uh, it's quite the feat. <laughs> But anyway, yes, it, I can imagine the first movie was a hell of an accomplishment. And I, I put it in the re review, but I found it interesting that he was a nobody, Cruz was, mm. and it made him. It made him. And, and yet Top Gun Maverick wouldn't have been made without him. You yeah. know, he's, he's come I, I back and he's gone, I want to be in a plane. I want to do this. I mean, I'm very surprised that he didn't persuade someone that he could fly the actual fighter planes. But, but to be honest, the things that he does in it will wow you i mean it's a it's a hell of a feat and you know space next maybe but um but i you know the guy just doesn't stop um anyway top gun you can see the original it's on sky i think it's on sky it is on sky but you probably want to pick up the disc i would say you can yeah. win it through the podcast competition or i think it's in uh hmv's 50 percent offer at the moment um, there'll be a bunch of deals mm. surrounding Top Gun 2 coming out, but uh, I would recommend seeing it because it's in, um, I would recommend picking up the disc because it's 4K, Dolby Vision, Dolby Atmos looks and sounds fantastic. It's the best way that you could possibly go about revisiting it. And it quite honestly versus the sky feed, it makes it seem a whole less, a whole lot less dated, proper filmic. And mm. a, a, just a gorgeous watch. So I would recommend hey, hey. Down Top Gun 4K before the must-see event <laughs> of this week. But I think it's I think the first showings are tomorrow or the day after, maybe. It's officially out Friday, this coming Friday. Yeah, that'll but, be it'd be out on Thursday, wouldn't it? Yeah. I, I mean it it is weird, isn't it? The such I mean, we we used to saturation of you know Marvel trailers popping up every now and again. 
Well, this feels next level. Cruise has been everywhere. You know, it is. <laughs> it, it, it is. I mean, you, you cannot move for Top Gun smacking you in the face at this moment in time, which is great. I mean, even my mum and dad said, oh, have you seen this new film? And I went, yeah, Top Gun. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if my mum and dad know about it, then honestly, someone in the marketing department is doing something right. But th- this, mm. this really does feel like proper event stuff. It's it gonna, yeah. it's gonna, it's gonna explode in the box office. Like, yes, it's I mean my my mum and dad want to see it. They're they're considerably older than me, and uh, and at the other end of the spectrum, I'm taking the kids along. So I'm trying to double down and take both their grandparents <laughs> and my kids. Uh, and that's another interesting. Get thing. them to take each other, Kaz. You it's, don't have to go. Oh, no, of course I've got to go and see it again, <laughs> just to supervise. Uh, that, that's another thing. I got a, I got a six-year-old and a nine-year-old. Uh, I had to see the film first because obviously it's a twelve. But it is, in my mind, uh, very safe for kids. Much more so than the first film because. Because it was all a bit too erotic, wasn't it? Yeah, there's some of that. And there's about erotic as a wet fish. (laughs) Come off it. The the second film is, yeah, it is it's probably (laughs) well, anyway, it's it's comfortably okay for them. They're gonna find the sequences tense, but I I wouldn't want them to miss out on seeing that at the big screen. But um, but yes, it's a it's a good good family film, I think, and one hell of an event. But you've been um, checking out other Tony Scott's masterpieces, haven't you, Mark? Uh, which one? There's so many. There's so Kaz. many. What's the so latest many. one that came to 4K? Well, uh, so Beverly Hills Cop Two came out, <laughs> uh, which is which is just it's gloriously messy. It's it's Eddie Murphy at the height of his ego, writing checks his mouth can't cash. <laughs> although in this case, it could. Uh, well, you, you, you've probably seen it, but you've probably not seen it for a while. Because you've probably still got the god awful taste of Beverly Hills Cop three in your mouth. That's probably the last film you saw. Uh, but Beverly Hills Cop two, very underrated sequel. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, the story is it's all over the shop. It's convoluted. It's ridiculous. Poor, I don't think poor old Jurgen Prochnow or Prochnow, however you pronounce it. I don't even think he understood what his plan was. Let alone us by the end of that <laughs> film. Uh, it was just about watching uh, Bridget Nielsen wear a parade of short skirts and try and piss her husband off at the time. Uh, but it's just, it's you, you go to watch Murphy and you go to watch uh, Tony Scott and they are there to the max. Murphy is giving it all with his filthy rat a tat that dialogue. It's like, oh, it's Olympic level swearing. It's beautiful. And of course, you've got Tony Scott who, who managed to crowbar in proper action scenes and then literally going, right, I've done my bit. Cameron Murphy, right, there you go, off you go, you know, for the next half an hour while Murphy's doing his thing. But it all worked. It all kind of fit together, uh, bathed in that magic hour glow. And, yeah, it's a it's a really, really solid sequel. On a, on a really... <sighs> I'm torn on the disc. So it's interesting. So, so Paramount, and we'll come on to talk about Paramount in the, dis- in the disc news. But... It's a beautiful transfer, absolutely beautiful. First of all, native 4K, Dolby Vision. Uh, it's, it's only lossless uh, 5.1. There's no Atmos remix on it, but it looks amazing. It's organic. It's The grain is fantastic. The fine detail is off the charts. The, obviously, it's the colours you come for. Those That Tony Scott magic hour sunset in the opening scenes as Ronnie Yates is jogging in that oil field against that burn orange sun. I mean, it looks amazing. It's everything you would have wanted. Uh, and uh, the 5.1 track is, is is equally good, but but like Escape from LA, not a sausage on it in terms of extras, nothing, not even a trailer or anything. And it's 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 odd because Paramount are obviously putting the miles in. They are they are going through their back catalogue. They are opening the vault. They are polishing it all off. They're doing. You'd argue they're prioritizing the right thing. They're prioritizing the transfer. But to not put anything out, I mean, in the States, the release of Beverly Hills Cop 2 is labelled a 35th anniversary edition. And there's still nothing on it. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Jesus, yeah, th- this, thing is, this thing has had so many releases, they couldn't even put the legacy features on from earlier. It's... Yeah, they've, done, they've done the same thing. I'm sure one of their earlier Blu-ray releases of Beverly Hills Cop mm. 2 was also labelled like 20th anniversary or something. I think that's 
Yeah. We've just I, got four minutes. I mean, it's, it, I know it's frustrating, but I, I don't, I, it, if I would, if I would let the lack of extras put me off picking up a gorgeous looking 4K disc, I mean, it's no, just you, annoying that they're insulting us with it and mm, wait for a two for yeah. 20. Ex- or well, exactly, like, like, a, a, exactly. Which, which, which maybe then feeds into the news piece about their deal with Kino, which oh, maybe yes. sort of hints at potentially where their heads have been at. Maybe what Paramount have been doing with some of these catalog releases, testing the water, yes, you know, and and maybe the water. It ain't so warm. Mm. No, I think they, yeah, we if say. they ship them to Kino. Well, we'll talk about that. But if they we'll, ship we'll, them to we'll, Kino, we'll, Kino we'll, will do it right. Well, but exactly. They'll do the hard yards and everyone's a winner. Apart from us, who will then have to buy it again. So w- aside from Beverly Hills Cop 2, which is a, a yes. good, good release, we have one absolute classic horror masterpiece and one... And Candyman. <laughs> and, and Candyman, Excellent. yes. Hey, tell, us, tell us about the masterpiece that is Stephen King's Cat's Eye on 4K. <laughs> uh, uh, well, well, yeah. So we'll start with the disc first. So it, it's it's very much a tale of two two cities with this one. It's a brand new 4K restoration. The the detail and the grain looks fantastic, but. But and this is a big but. The restoration is done by a uh, a team called uh, Haventi from France, and Studio yeah. Canal have used them a lot. And their restorations, shall we say, are proving somewhat problematic. Uh, the, in in the case of Cat's Eye, it is a new color grade, which literally looks like it's been dipped in cold tea uh (laughs) there is a yellow tint to pretty much everything now i had the old us blu-ray for cat side i did a couple of comparisons and it's it's honestly it's bizarre you don't really notice it on the skin tones as such but shots where there are bright white buildings on the blu-ray are now a sort of borderline sepia color on this new 4k and it really undermines the restoration work that's been done now you could argue oh well who's to say which which version is right i i I don't think back in the day that church was that yellow shall we say uh and and the other interesting thing about it is i know that in my reviews i've i've i tried to because I do the majority of my viewing on a projector and therefore HDR10 for critical viewing only. I try and do a, a Dolby Vision versus HDR10 comparison on, on my LCD in the lounge. And it's only a, 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 a not great LCD, but considering it's it's still same settings on the display, the only difference is the, the, the layer on the disc. In cat size, uh, in this instance, the typical difference between your Dolby Vision layer and your HDR10 layer, you know, slightly more saturated colours, richer, slightly brighter palette. Uh, it really goes against Cat's Eye in this. There's a scene early on where James Woods is walking into the quitter's office. And in HDR10, it's a it's a sort of off-white colour, looks a bit, but, you know, one of those bland corporate office colors you flip to dolby vision and it is almost sickly turquoise it's that bright and then it's had a similar effect on some of the 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 skin tones as well so i think in 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 this instance on cat's eye it's it's gonna be a transfer that is going to split the audience i think uh hardcore fans who've seen it before on disc are gonna hate this new transfer uh, those that go, well, I've not seen it since I was six on VHS. They're going to buy it and they're going to love it and think it looks amazing. So it's going to be a very, very divisive transfer, I think. Much uh, like the film, I think, because there's hmm. loads of people who seem to remember it being an absolute masterpiece. Yeah. It is. Would you concur? Uh, no, well, uh, well I, I've seen it several times since that early childhood viewing, shall we say. And I just, I just think that when, when you hear about how it came about it came about through this sort of two-pronged approach from stephen king wanting to get into filmmaking and coming off the back of writing creep show so it was already oh do that again anthology film do that again mr king versus dino de laurentis having come off the back of firestarter with uh having had a good relationship with drew barrymore who was exploding in the tabloids and suddenly you've got this anthology film over here with a small child at the heart of it over here, put them together. And, you know, 
if that's how it came about, that's fine. But everyone who's ever read a Stephen King book of short stories know there are simply better short stories out there that, that would have made a better film. Yeah. It's not to say that they're not fun. Quitters Inc. is quite amusing. James Woods is is off his rocker, which is always good fun to watch. The ledge is is a bit is is, is a bit dull, but but you know, quite frankly, I like Robert Hayes out of airplane. It's nice to see him in a role. Mm-hmm. And at least with the final story with Drew Barrymore, you've got that pretty cool little devil imp, which still looks I can't creepy. work out whether it's cute or creepy. Uh so you know, it's it it's fun. But it's, it's, yeah, it's no candy, man. I'll tell you that for <laughs> nothing. Uh, so, so, yeah, and a bit, it, it's a very much a case of buyer beware on this disc, I have to say. It's a weird thing. I mean, I, I had no recollection of the film. And then I read your review and I thought, I've seen this. <laughs> it was rubbish. <laughs> Is this mm. when you were rewatching Candyman? <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, I've only seen that long, long, long time ago. Um, I, I, it was on VHS after after Creep Show. Um, you know, mm-hmm. I thought, oh look, much like the, it, it got to <coughs> got to air. I thought, oh look, that's, oh yeah, yeah, I know that. I'll, I'll stick that in. That'll be a good laugh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 I mean, to be, to be fair, though, considering you followed it up with Maximum Overdrive, we should be grateful for Cat's well, Eye, true. really, shouldn't we? That was we? a terrible film, So, it? you oh, know. So, story. yeah. It, it's, it's fun, but it's very inessential and very unworthy of a full 4K restoration, if I'm going to be brutally honest. Well, you know, I, I'm always one to say the more that comes out, the better. I yeah. mean, you, you're, yeah, you're yeah. absolutely right about that. But, but you know, they're going to hit some that i'd like on 4k uh, true very that, true that other people might not i mean they could do the entire beat to kashi katani back catalog and it would only make me happy but it would make me very happy. For extreme <laughs> prejudice cas in 4k oh you know what i i would go for <laughs> you're uh, jumping the gun we'll we'll yes. come to extreme prejudice and mark's <laughs> first experience of extreme prejudice oh really um, yeah, I know. Tell me, tell me you like great... that, Simon. I do, actually. Yes. I watched, again, this was a, a very, very early VHS film. In fact, it might have been one of the very first films I saw on VHS. Um, back, back, my goodness me, long, long time ago. Um, back when pirate videos were a thing. Um, yeah, okay, so Dirty let's, Harry. Let's do it now. 80s, oh. Walter Hill. He's come off the back of um, working on the script for Sam Peckinpah's The Getaway with Steve McQueen. He's done his own The Getaway, which was uh, the excellent Ryan O'Neill cult driver, classic Driver, driver yeah. which is kind of where mm. we got Drive from. Yeah. And he's decided to make this homage to Peckinbar and the Wild Bunch uh, by way of, I don't know, High Noon, um, starring Nick Nolte and yeah. a slew of you know very young you might recognize them now actors like clancy brown and william forsyth uh and michael ironside michael um, bloody michael ironside. bloody ironside come on and powers booth yes um and it's and it's uh it has nick nolte's you know very hard nosed sheriff on the border um dealing with his best friend cash great name who's who's uh he, who was his best friend but is now a major drug dealer and they're still close friends but there's a little love hate relationship because cash got the girl and naughty loves the girl and all that kind of stuff and in the background michael ironside has landed with a crack team of presumed dead special ops soldiers I have no idea what transpires that requires basically lots of slow motion shooting and squibs to go off all over the shop as people get shot and blown across the screen, proper peck and pass style, mm. um, and have a blast. And uh, Nolte and Powers Booth, you know, go toe to toe. I mean, it's it just goes insane at the end. And remember. Mark hadn't seen it it's incredible it's crazy I know. it's quintessential it's, you, it's I your know. thing it really i your know thing. i think it's a new new studio studio canal cult classics it range. is a, it's a port of the vestron you know the vestron yeah. range over in the states they're releasing it so it's a port of that 
So uh, the Studio Canal have nabbed it. They've launched, yeah. I mean, I think the Cult Classics range is a new range. I think it is. I think and it is. Their first one is Extreme Prejudice. I'm telling Mark about it. Mark hasn't seen it. <laughs> Ship him off the disc. And uh, now he's watched it. And suffice to say, you are sold. Two thumbs, two thumbs up or two whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever. No, it, yeah. it says I am halfway through sneak sneak peek for this. I am halfway through uh, June's Blu-ray titles, you know, and and I I, I am not going to see a better film than Extreme Prejudice. Oh, this no. is, I am this not going to see it. Yeah, I'm just not. You know, Jim Jarmusch. You get stuff, mate. You keep your black and white moody bollocks over there. No, <laughs> so that is uh, I, um, that is the best Blu-ray news. Of it the, is, of it the, is. Yes, of the podcast, isn't it? But on <laughs> on Mark's top ten for June, we're going to have extreme prejudice at the top. I, I am proud. Prejudice. And as you say, I would be very chuffed with that on four K. And yes, I suspect not many people would. <laughs> I, I would now. Yeah. I'd be there. <laughs> um. What other 4K news? Well, we got Cruiser's Edge of Tomorrow coming I, in. I, I, well, 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 hang on. We, did, we, did we miss Candyman? Oh, we did miss Candyman. Did we miss oh, Candyman? Sorry. Sorry. Come on, too many times. Yeah. Come on, no, size. Candyman, 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 Candyman. Candyman, Candyman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is this your favourite horror? Um, um, oh, it's, it's my, my favourite Clive Barker um adaptation I one say. of your favorite horrors though. yeah one of my favorite horrors oh. um my all-time favorite would be nosferatu mm. but um the uh but Candyman is an awesome film because just because of what it stands for it's it's not your typical stalk and slash horror it's although it's got that element to it it kind of it's creepy it's it's romantic it's hypnotic it's visceral um and i and i just think it needs needs more exposure and particularly mm. the uk cut which virtually no one has seen because everyone gets the, gets the r-rated version mm. and this um uh 4k disc has got both on if you and you when you press play it offers you which one you want to play watch the uk version because it's slightly i in my opinion it's slightly better because when the um when Candyman attacks the uh uh the psychiatrist it's pretty darn gory it's much much more visceral and it's really that's nice very, very slight drop up on picture quality but you can live with that just for the blood gun the... oh, oh, <laughs> oh it's lovely 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 um it's um this podcast just got an explicit rating for size <laughs> size dirty sex face there probably <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I just think it's a great film. It's a great set, actually. It's a very, very good disc. Um, you know, uh, the picture quality is fantastic. Um, I mean, it's coming off the back of the, the 2018 restoration, which was a 4K restoration, um, and they've just slapped a Dolby Vision on top of it, and it's really give it an extra boost. So it's a, a wonderful picture, and Dolby Atmos as well. I mean, yeah. you know, it's, it's when when Tony Todd speaks, it's it's like, the voice of God. It is unbelievable. It's everywhere and it permeates you and goes through you just like his hook. It's going to rip your heart out. It's fantastic. Um, Philip strange that it's been so um, polarizing on, on the thread, though, how people hate <laughs> it and people don't. It's, it's bizarre. It doesn't mm. seem to have a middle ground. Well, I, I think what's interesting is it's, it's people who've come to it after all the the hype so people who didn't see it back in the 90s people who are coming to it now having having read that it is this you know lyrical yeah. ethereal yeah. gothic romance you know with 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 a social and all this kind of stuff and and i suppose it, it, it's it's the problem of expectation isn't it so i, I can yeah, i can be. i can see why people coming to it might not feel it is the classic that certainly i agree with sai that it is uh but yeah it's it's been interesting reading the reading the threads yeah, with right. like, like, like like you say there's more more people don't like candy man but love cat's eye it's like what what crazy you know the, what the, crazy the, world are we in the, yeah. this is a crazy world that was too crazy for every, for, for everything everywhere all at once even they didn't show a world that mad <laughs> just people misremembering stuff uh, but it is interesting what you say mark about um about how you you know you big things up i think think that I that sentiment is something that I think about uh, a film will come on to shortly which is everything everywhere all at once it's currently getting a, a lot of good press mm. saying it's going to be the best film of the year 
Uh, and I think that runs the risk of alienating people who would have oh, come absolutely. in and, and walked in and gone, wow, this is something pretty special. I didn't expect this. Instead, they're walking in going, I'm waiting for it to get really special. I didn't expect this. So, um, so it's, it is interesting that managing expectations, mm. you know, he says after overselling Top Gun Maverick. <laughs> <laughs> there, there is a question on the thread which is how much IMAX footage an hour there's an hour of IMAX footage in Top Gun Maverick so and it's all the plane footage go and go see it IMAX really an hour of that phenomenal um should we do some disc news yeah go on then yeah okay so Cruiser's Edge of Tomorrow is coming to 4k which is nice. right timing yeah nice good I'm going to get the TAT edition. I can't not get the TAT edition. I know it's a ridiculous price, but it's not as Avi exclusive, so I feel a little bit more like I'll justify it. Um, coming in July, and uh, not the only cruise either, Tropic Thunder. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's a bizarre one. Man. Well, it isn't a bizarre one, though, is it? It's not a bizarre choice because the reason behind it, Tropic Thunder, is coming to 4K courtesy of Kino because of their new deal with Paramount. Mm -hmm. So Kino uh, have a new deal with Paramount. They picked up 64 titles, not not all 4K. I think only 15 of them are 4K. Um, But 64 titles in in total, ranging from the 40s through to the 2010s. And um, amongst those, there are 15 4K debuts. No one quite knows what they are. Well, we know one, Tropic Thunder. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're hoping. The major- majority of the ones they picked up are, as far as I can tell, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Mm. I think the 50s, 60s, and 70s are all double digits, the number of discs that are being released in those eras. Mm. And the 80s is like nine, and the 90s is eight, and then, it, and then it's less and less at mm. either end of that spectrum. Uh, I would say people are hoping for Once Upon a Time in the West, Chinatown, Marathon Man, Truman Show, There Will Be Blood, maybe even Face Off. Um, It's that kind of range. No one knows what's coming out, but it is an interesting Mm. deal for a number of reasons. We touched Mm. upon this before because Paramount, pretty bad at doing anything other than just sticking it on a disc. Mm. Disc may look and sound really Mm. nice, but you can't stick Beverly Hills Cop 2 on a disc and call it 35th anniversary Mm. edition. And not have Mark go. Where are my extras? Damn oh it. my! Oh my God! No. What if Kino's second 4K release is Beverly Hills Cop Three? Oh, oh my no. God! <laughs> Shoot me think, now! I think they've only got one film <laughs> to release from that era, and you might have been saved by Tropic Thunder. Quite honestly, oh, it'll be the God. only time in your life God. you thank Tropic yes. Thunder. Yeah, oh, no, I, I like Tropic Thunder. It just feels a bit like you say. Like you say, someone, someone's gone there. What's your release first? Chinatown. Or Tropic Th- mm. <laughs> you know. The only reason I could possibly see is that um, it, they thought none of the other films Star Cruise, so we just get that out there now. I can't, I can't see any reason why Tropic Thunder would be mm. the first to be unleashed. Although well, I did, I did it, re- read a rumor that they, they were under contract to release Tropic Thunder first, it, which yeah. sounds farcical, but possibly. Yeah. Well, don't, don't, don't forget, you've got Downey Jr. in there, haven't you? You've got, yeah. uh, you, you, you know, so 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 the, so there's the the MCU connection while it's still so hot right now, uh, <laughs> you know. So, I mean, so. It, it, you know, Kino are undoubtedly on a roll. They've got um, a following that they did good, the bad, and the ugly on 4K, which I, I'll say right now, still no UK release. Yeah, so people are, people are still shipping it from Kino, mm-hmm. from the US. And they this month, they're doing the other dollars films, Festival of Dollars for a few dollars more. Oh, yeah. And happy, I happy. don't think we'll get a 4K release in the UK of those. So Kino are really, they're in business. I mean, I, I am interested in what we get from this. And mm. they're going to be, people are going to be paying 30, they're going to be paying collector's edition set prices. To, no. to ship a disc mm, from America. No, no, because you know what? I th- I think that for a big studio like Paramount's do deal with Kino, I think they're not just going to limit it to the US. I think we're going to see a similar Paramount deal with one of the UK boutique labels. I think someone like Arrow would be 
would be placed well to do a similar deal, I would imagine. Uh, so I won't be surprised if, yeah, maybe not for Tropic Thunder. But like Paramount uh, Plus, it'll be like a year later, won't it? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah but, but, but isn't this interesting? You'd have thought now with Paramount Plus, you know, on the verge of being launched here in its in its early infancy over in the States, why is it not now doing what Disney would have done, which is say, balls to the physical releases let's stick it all on the streaming platform and use that to hook people in so it's an interesting it's it's an interest i mean it's the anti-disney in terms of the the model for get getting your films out to market i, I, I mean, I mean it, it, is, it makes it no is, but, sense but really the, if you think about it kino kino are, are good for their collector sets yeah i mean the nice thing about kino is sure it doesn't come with all the tats but it actually comes with extra features yeah you yeah know, but these releases we get with all the tat that's just designed to make you true. not look at the fact there's nothing on the disc true but they're not immune from the old uh cock-ups are they uh, and and no. let's just say when they do cock up, they don't have as good a track record for fixing it as the likes of Arrow do and things like that. So oh, I don't know. I had an I had a brand new hard target turn up, complete with packaging. None of this what Arrow do, which is ship me just the disc, and you have to send the whole uh-huh. disc back or send a photocopy. There's a brand new sealed yeah, hard yeah. target sitting here, which they. And the fact that it's sealed, Kaz, is a crime. It's oh, a it's crime. Too much other stuff to uh, watch. <laughs> but but then, but then again, they, they never even acknowledged the cock up with Sounds of the Lambs, though, did they? So no, no, yeah. uh, you know. But yeah. but anyway, but anyway, I think I think it's a fan, it's fantastic it's news because the more the more we can get access to those big studios back catalogues on disc, the better. The better. Sure, it's like a, yeah. don't, don't yeah, care who it is. Let's get them out. I mean, to be fair, as much as I've been bitching about paramount at least getting the likes of escape from la and beverly hills cop 2 out on 4k disc with great transfers i'll have that over over not having it quite frankly yes over cat size (laughs) (laughs) yes yes so all good news for disc fans yes uh and another another disc that's not we're not going to get in this well briefly touching on we've got untouchables 4k in may as well Yep. We got the Batman, which oddly has started shipping from Italy, mm-hmm. uh, but doesn't come out in the UK until mid-June. And I think it comes out in the US a bit earlier as well, yep. but it's hard to get a hold of. Mm. Um, so, you know, that, that's interesting. It's interesting that it's all, all from Warner, but they've staggered the Reese for some well, they, they did it with June, reason. didn't they? They did it with yes. June. We, yes, we all I imported remember. the Italian steelbook yes. month yeah, we did. before <laughs> it was released, didn't it? So, you know, it seems an odd model to do. And why Italy of all <laughs> places? Know. <sighs> Who knows? Yeah, but they're going to get all the money now, aren't they? That's true. <laughs> um, there's also a Everything Everywhere All at Once 4K disc rumoured to be coming for to, uh, to 4K in July. Um, the reason why I found this interesting is because just like Kino, I doubt they'll be any kind of uk 4k release uh you've seen it haven't you mark i have a lot re- well you it. did you reviewed uh, it I, I, no because no, i just pulled that review on my it. backside <laughs> <laughs> i was watching face off while i wrote that <laughs> so, well it was interesting because tom tom saw it before you and i think uh i think there was a an element of expectation or, or concern that uh, if it didn't get the the score that tom would have wanted it to score he would never speak to us again i, I know i think he would have literally turned up on my doorstep with, 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 with a with a implement of some kind uh, yes the, the bucket from no man land yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but yeah i mean i've seen it as well and uh i loved it i thought it's tremendous so a little bit of background to this this is uh michelle yo in the multiverse um on a budget but you can't really tell it's on a budget but it's it's hugely inventive um it came out around the same time as dr strange which was curious timing Mm. um i don't want to big it up to people because i feel like they're going to go in and expect dr strange it isn't that kind of film i mean it's a it's a very clever small but big um multiverse film. <laughs> you're not helping there kaz <laughs> well it is, it is i mean it's small scale with a lot of heart to it and so you know it's mm-hmm. set in a laundromat michelle yo 
you know, she's struggling with day-to-day existence, family existence, bonding with her daughter, dealing with her cranky dad. It's all, it's all fairly normal. Uh, and they, uh, they address the multiverse ideas in it tremendously well mm. and with a great sense yeah. of kind of wild abandon and the, it's no holds barred with whatever pinata flavored multiverse you you want to leap to it's not just that they're wearing different clothes and have a mustache i mean it's it's very very inventive and uh, you know i can see why people are lapping it up as as one of the potentially one of the best films of the year mm. but you can't go into it with any expectations because any of those preconceptions those whatever you've built up in your mind about what this kind of film should look like it won't mm. look like that it's unlike anything you've ever seen before scenes from it you might recognize and some scenes might completely blow your mind but as a whole it's madness utter madness <laughs> And if you embrace it, it's a hell of a ride. Mm. Just don't go into it going, oh, yeah, this is going to be on someone's Oscar list as the best movie of the year. Not that kind of film. Although I really hope it is. Oh, yeah, yeah I hope it is as well. <laughs> but it won't be. But that's no. OK. I mean, it's, yeah. it is just yeah. mad. It's a, it's a, a crazy ass film. Uh, Mark gave it a nine. I think Tom shouted 10 from the back of the cinema very loudly. <laughs> yes. Sometimes. Uh, mine's up there around that score mm. although it's the kind of film you don't really want to score it's so bewilderingly out there I'd just say it's unlike anything you've ever seen or will probably ever see again um, but that's that's on 4k maybe if you can't get out to see it in the cinema another import going to be importing loads uh, we, we're running short of time so we might have to Skip really quickly through some streaming and TV show news. Uh, well, let's do that. Let's do okay. that then, Cass. Let's do that. I let's did that. Love, Death, and Robots. Do you do both of you follow Love? Ah, uh, yes, I, I've watched a few of them. They're I, pretty cool. I do. I love them. I've just watched the first two of series three tonight. Absolutely love them. Yeah, episode brilliant. two is tremendous. Of the this new is one, great fun. So, um, I, I happen to. I mean, it's hard. It's hard to bring them all back into my mind whilst doing this. I happen to think this is a contender for the strongest. It's the better than the, the second season, yeah, without a doubt. Very, much, much better. It's a longer season as well, I think, nine episodes, but it's it's got some real fantastically dark chapters in it and some good wit. Um, but I, I think uh, it's a tough call for me between the first and the last, uh, sorry, the second and the last episodes. The one with the crab. The and, crab, uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. and the and the one with the siren at the end. I mean, that's that won't be for. I've not seen that one yet. Oh, I don't know. I just love those. I just love those brilliantly witty three robots yeah. who did yeah. take yeah, a, take fun. a trip through mankind's destruction with gleeful whimsy. They're I brilliant. Do like it when they go to the survivalist <laughs> camp. I think yeah. the pull out quote in the review from that is that, isn't it? You know, it's, it's saying, did they did they really uh, want? this apocalypse and the robot was saying yes um apparently there were some people who did actually want an apocalypse who didn't believe in government sponsored healthcare and believed that they could survive on beef jerky and an endless supply of ammunition <laughs> it's just, it was, uh, it's quality a, tremendous it's very very nice stuff. very nice commentary on that one um, we also got Kenobi coming this Friday. <coughs> Very exciting. Yes. I think the first two episodes. Nice. We'll watch. Yes. I guess, well, I yeah, guess yeah. I'll watch it. Yes, you will. It'll be great. Uh, It'll be think, really, really good. I don't know. I've been burnt by that um, Boba Fett rubbish. Don't. Don't. It'll bring it all back. Well, Trust that's... me. Okay. All, all right. right. All right. Um, less, less certain about Marvels, but we'll get on to that. Stranger Things. Is anyone up on Stranger Things? Yeah, I, I, I love Stranger Things. Although I tell you what, I'm going to have to watch a recap for the for the first three seasons. Uh, they go it's, it's, down. it's quite they, simple. Yeah, um, they go up. Alien down. Beastie. Yeah, keeps coming up. It's uh, there you it's, go. It's, oh, it's, you can, a bit you can put that on the internet today. <laughs> Stranger <laughs> Things in 30 yeah. seconds. Alien there's Beastie. There's a Beastie. Just yeah, keeps coming. Up. The upside down. There upside you go. down. It's the same, same story. Yeah, someone's uh, in trouble. Who knows? Anyway, this is 4.1, half of the 
the latest yeah season. not a fan of that mm. bloody really schedule don't, no. don't what's even. all that about that's a new netflix thing well it's not even just new to netflix but it's a netflix thing at the moment um ms marvel with the fantastic special effects that look like shrek um no sorry no ms marvel is the one that with the effects that look good uh, you're talking about she hulk oh, yeah she hulk yeah, yeah, yeah. is the ones that look like shrek shrek hulk yeah. yeah i'm i mean I'm it's a watch great meme actually i've <laughs> seen it <laughs> i get a, great i'm gonna watch them all but um but they're really gonna have to do some polishing on she hulk and to I mean, not that... make uh, everything that yeah. people talk about but they got tim roth back haven't they they did get tim roth so back. i mean you know he must see so i mean surely he's not that hard up for cash is he i, th- I think he saw a pretty big check i think mm-hmm. i think that's it's mm. possible. Do you think he's got a big role in it, or do you think he's just Didn't like he one of the clients? Or something? I can't remember what happened to him. Didn't he? I thought he got squashed. Well, yeah, but his his magical yeah. healing abilities will. Oh. And, and he was. In, oh yeah, yeah. He, he was in Shang Chi. Uh, yeah. Allegedly in Shang Chi. I still don't know if that was. Yeah, it that was. was. Or not. Yeah, it was cage fighting in Shang Chi mm. because um, was... Wong comes to get him, and and takes him back. Mm. Yeah, oh, lost it out of my mind. <laughs> um, returning to Top Gun 2, Joe Kaczynski's latest, uh, Spiderhead, which had a whole bunch of different titles. I'm sure it's called Escape from Spiderhead at one stage and something else. Mm-hmm. Whatever it is, all of them are better titles than, than Spiderhead. Uh, that's coming to mm-hmm. Netflix uh, with Chris Hemsworth and mm, Miles Teller, again from Top Gun. Nice. Netflix. Oh, hopefully um, he's kept his tash. I don't think so. Uh, I don't think so. It's not a Tash Gate scenario. Uh, it'd be interesting to see how good that is. I mean, obviously, it's been a couple of years since they did Maverick, so because since he's got another one in the can, um, it'd be interesting to see what that's like on Netflix. And good timing, you know, good timing for the director. Mm. Uh, we also got coming to to Netflix. I mean, thanks to Andy's great lists, we can look at. Uh, Sandler's latest, which thankfully isn't a pure old comedy, and is actually <laughs> Hustle, a drama, um, basketball drama, I think. Um, I'm up for that. And uh, Umbrella Academy season three. Which, they're good fun normally. Yeah, they're pretty good. Yeah, um, quite like them. And Inceptor, which caught my fancy. It's uh, I'm gonna no, it's Elsa from Chris Hemsworth's Elsa, his wife. Um, she what, was from Frozen. In, yeah, no. <laughs> She was in the Fast and Furious films. And uh, I mean, it doesn't, I had never heard of it before, but I did hear that she underwent some serious training in firearms and in martial arts to do it. So, uh, you know, it, it could be a lot of fun. So, yeah. Um, Mark has been quickly looking at prehistoric planet on Apple TV, and I'm remiss in not having showed that to the kids. Mm, it's yeah, first, so they're dropping an episode a night uh, this week. So, five, five episodes. The first one came out today, it's about sea beasties. Uh, but it's just, I, you know, it, you know exactly what it is. It's, it's walking with dinosaurs, but with just some stunning special effects. The, the, the technology now, the, the effects work is it's just sublime on it, it really is. And you know, it's just the usual things. Oh, look, cute dinosaur. Oh, no, it's dead. Oh, look, there's another cute dance. Oh, oh, no, that's dead. Oh, no, there's a cute old dad. Di- oh, no, that's dead. So, you know, it's, as, as long as as long as you're a fan of the whole circle of life shenanigans, it's very, very good eye candy. I think, uh, I think I have to take the kids through that once I've mm. finished showing them all things Top Gun. Um, Simon and I have been watching Star Trek Strange Strange New Worlds. Strange New Worlds, uh, yes, episode seen two. Episode two. I'm only maybe three quarters of the way into it. And ah, you've then... seen it all then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so I'm, not... I'm quite enjoying it still. Oh, it's it's gone off the rails for you, has it? Well, not yet. I mean, not yet. It's just this. Um, the the I like. The idea is good. Okay, they've gone back to sort of the next generation idea of taking a character and giving them something to do. Yeah. Um, and in this instance, it's a hurrah, which is quite good, giving her a little bit of backstory, making you know who she is, where she comes from, what she's doing, giving her a little bit of an arc within that story. You know, getting lost, finding herself, wanting to go, carry on. You know, that's that's all good stuff. Um, but the larger aspect of it, the um, the the prime directive stuff, seriously, guys. 
you're making Star Trek. Go and watch Star Trek. You must know what the Prime Directive is. <laughs> Seriously. You know, just because a thing is going to hit another thing, that is not Prime Directive stuff. That's going to yeah. happen. You just don't get involved. <laughs> I think so. the only way to watch it is with a Picard chaser. It is. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, I quite like you know. it. I mean, I, I, and I still love Pike. I mean, uh, yeah, he is good. And, and actually, when he, when he was dealing with the with the the the, the threat, I thought yeah. he was very good. He was actually, very. There was none of this fire yeah. fire first, ask questions later. It was more, well, it, more yeah. diplomacy. It and was, he it was and good. he has a nice sense, kind of dry wit about him when mm. the when the torpedoes kind of bounce off. He's like, "Is that supposed to have shields?" <laughs> yeah. you know, he's, he's, I've yeah, got, it's, I've got yeah. time to spend with him as a captain. I mean, there, I, there I, is a lot good about it. Um, yeah. I'm not dissing it too much. Um, I'm, just a little bit. But turn the lights down a bit in the bridge as well, will you? For Christ's sake. Uh, Seriously. You wait until we get it in. <laughs> when uh, the, in the original HDR. series, you had a little bulb go red, 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 red. This thing, the whole bloody bridge goes red. I mean, come on. Yes. But and of all, all, of all I was going to say, of all the things, I si, of all know, the things, I know. the brightness of the bulbs on the bridge. <laughs> I know. Really. Yeah. But it's everywhere. You know, <clears throat> it's like they've gone, oh, look, let's just paint it all red. It's red alert. Let's paint everything red. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's too much of the J.J. Abrams, you know, with the lights beaming at your face. <laughs> How can they see anything to do anything when it's all red? <laughs> Shall we give someone a competition? I think yeah, we go on then. Okay, so to round us off, we have the podcast competition to win a copy of Top Gun on 4K. And the question which you need to use to select the correct answer What is Tom Cruise's character's name in Top Gun and Top Gun Maverick? All right, there you go. It's really, really hard, guys. Um, that's it for the AV Performs podcast this week. Thanks to both the hardware and the movies team. If you enjoyed the podcast, please give us a like and subscribe to the channel, plus hit the notification bell so you don't miss out when we publish our live streams, product reviews, and more. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, bookmark avforums.com for the latest reviews, news, and videos. Plus, why not give us a five-star rating on whichever service you use, if they allow it, but only if you enjoyed the show. I'm Kaz Harlow. Thank you for watching and listening, and join us for the next podcast on the 13th of June. Doodle pip, y'alls. Bye-bye.